Today on CityCast Boise, my Friday besties Frankie Barnhill and George Prentice are here to round up this week's news. We're talking religion and Idaho politics, the possible eviction of 93 elderly residents on the bench, and is Amtrak really coming to Boise? Plus, George brings on the movie trivia quiz. It's Friday, February 17th. I'm Emma Arnold, and this is what Boise's talking about. Hi, Frankie. Hi, George. Hi. Emma, hi. (laughs) Happy Friday. (laughs) Yes, happy Friday. Thank you both for being here. I'm excited to talk to you. We have a lot uh, lot happening this week in the news. Uh, We're going to hit some of the highlights, I guess, or lowlights, depending on how you feel about it. But let's start with this House Bill 105 in the Education Committee that requires all schools to have In God We Trust prominently displayed. George, I know you just had a story on this, right? Right. And again, it's must display, right? It's not an option. And I think that that is really the heart of this debate. So in God we trust, okay, I think most people say, well, at least it's on the money, that's well. But the argument that the sponsors are making is that, well, our founders, you know, this is from them, this is on all of our founding documents. It's not. It's not on any founding documents, and it's important that people know the history and the nuance of In God We Trust, and it is complex. Yeah, it kind of brings up a broader question of religion in Idaho politics in general. And, you know, we saw a lot of public and legislative testimony uh, this week on HB 71, the anti-trans legislation that was religious in nature. And Frankie, you brought up like that the Idaho Family Policy Center, which is an explicitly Christian lobbying group, like behind the anti trans bill, like they're not being quiet about it. there are reasons for this, right? They're like, this is Christian nationalism. This is what we're doing. Right. And and some people might hear Christian nationalism go, ooh, that sounds really extra scary or that, that sounds militant or something like that. But really, Christian nationalism, it just means people who view um, Christianity as the guiding principles of American politics, American laws, and they want to see Christianity infused throughout public life in America, and they believe that's the right thing. So, um, yeah, to see the Idaho Family Policy Center, which is fairly new on the scene, I don't know, a few years that they've been really explicitly lobbying around issues at the state house. Yeah, I mean, they're not shying away from the fact that this is religious in nature, their their concerns around gender affirming care, as we said, as we saw um, get passed this week, uh, that bill is now headed to the Senate. Uh, You know, they're concerned about what's in libraries that children can access, and they want to see school vouchers go to private schools, including Christian schools, um, so that parents who want to send their kids to a Christian school will have, you know, money to do so. So, it's just very, it's very explicit these days in the Idaho legislature. George, do you feel like it's always been like that? I think it's extremely organized, and I just keep coming back to that. Uh, for those folks who think that the uh, the groups that are proposing this, they are not the folks in pickups driving around Boise honking their horns, wave, waving flags. They're extremely organized. Uh, this is boilerplate language that is being distributed to state houses around the country, and they are working the phones. They are really working the phones. And who are they calling? They are calling moderate Republicans because that is what will pass. I think the key to this session is the vote count because a lot of these bills, I think, are candidates for vetoes from Governor Brad Little, who does see, see certain things as unconstitutional, whether it's a school funding or whether it's just separation of church and state, right? I think they are candidates for veto, so it's important that we count the votes. If there is a two-thirds majority that are passing these bills, chances are they're probably going to become law. Yeah, I, it makes me think of this national survey and story from NPR on Christian nationalism that just came out. Frankie, I know you have been sort of digging into that. 
Well, first off, this is in the survey, but we know that people who go to church, uh, that has been declining for years across the country, while at the same time, there's been this uh, surge of political interest in um, like evangelical churches, specifically white evangelical churches around the country. It's not as though this is new. There's the moral majority from the 80s. Like this goes back, you could go back to the 50s. Uh, there's a lot of history around the country around how Christianity is, has been a part of American politics for a long time. But it is interesting to see these numbers. So half of Republicans around the country believe that the country should be a strictly Christian nation. And then another 21% think that either adhere, adhering to the ideals of Christian nationalism or sympathizing with those views, that's that 33 percent, that's how that breaks down. And then that 10 percent of Americans view themselves as adherents of Christian nationalism, so not just Republicans, but across America. So that's fascinating. There's also some other studies like Pew Research Center does really great stuff around religious views, and they have some data specifically on Idaho um, around questions like belief in, in God and uh, whether or not uh, how, how important people feel of religion is in their life, whether they pray, how often they pray. And you can see the, the Idaho specific data there. Um, so yeah, I mean, I feel like just painting this picture, this broader picture nationally, but then also really drilling down. And I think what George said about it being very organized in Idaho, that may be kind of the newer element, like having Idaho Fo Family Policy Center being a fairly new thing on the scene speaks to really this organization that's happened. So you said 10 percent of Americans view themselves as Christian nationalists, but probably higher in Idaho, right? Like we we can probably guess that that's higher. Yeah, yeah. When you're talking about people who are um, interested in seeing their Christian views reflected in Idaho laws, probably, probably. I mean, just speaking in terms of, you know, what we're seeing at the state house and that these bills are kind of sailing through right now. Um, so if, if we're having a reflective democracy, now that's not to say that every Christian believes that. Like there are plenty of Christians who don't think that they want religion out of politics. So that's that's a that's a complicated uh, a picture to paint. But we know that in Idaho, it seems as though people at the state house are interested in, in infusing that in the laws more and more. Mm. And I think that's a really important point, Frankie. Is how many people of faith are pushing back and are, but have really not wanted to engage in politics but almost have to now right? Um, and are saying, do not hijack my faith. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It seems, I don't know, I don't have a, a, the vocabulary for this exactly, but this last week, it felt like so many things were coming through uh, the legislature and through the House right now. It was hard to keep track of everything. So even if you were like, well, I'm, I'm really passionate about this anti-trans stuff, then you're like, oh, wait, also the library stuff. Also, you know, this uh, In God We Trust stuff. Like there was so much happening. It does feel really organized. And it's hard for just a regular person who maybe wasn't engaged with politics before to jump in and and become engaged because you can't testify at everything, even if you wanted to. They're limiting testimony and stuff. So I just wonder, like, how is the average person supposed to engage with this? I think, Emma, I think exhaustion is a strategy. Mm. Um, honestly, I do. I think it's uh, most people are exhausted already and they roll their eyes, throw up their arms and stop paying attention. And before you know it, April is here. They're gone. And these things become law. Some of them as soon as this July and people say, hold it. Wait, what? And I think it's exhausting sometimes to even pour through the media. I think it's actually a strategy. And what we're seeing, especially from so many freshman legislators from North Idaho, they are pushing legislation through like a fire hose. Uh, and if I may, the game book also includes school boards, library uh, uh, district boards, health district boards, city councils. This is the, the game book, right, is to... Uh, get in front of them, exhaust them. A lot of these people uh, are part-time folks who just want to help out, and they say, I'm out of here, right? And then they become members of these boards, et cetera, and that game book climbs that ladder to the state house and beyond. <laughs> Hi, Boise, it's Emma. 
You usually hear me chatting it up with our guests, but right now I have a question for you. Have you ever thought about advertising on CityCast Boise? Every day, this podcast reaches the people who care most about what's happening in our community. Our listeners are the first to try new restaurants and venues. They're giving standing ovations at every show and cultural event. They're socially involved and devastatingly cool. So why not put your message right into the ears of Boise's most engaged and passionate audience? You can learn more at boise.citycast.fm slash advertise or send us an email at ads at citycast.fm. Well, let's move on to Boise Devs. Margaret Carmel just had this really heartbreaking story about an assisted living center that's most likely going to become apartments unless the decision's overturned. Arbor Village at Hillcrest is home to 93 elderly residents that now have to relocate. And I have to say, reading through these stories, uh, it sounds like something out of an 80s movie, like real (laughs) textbook, you know, villain stuff of like, I'm closing down the old folks home to build luxury apartments. And then, you know, a group comes in and they have a concert and they're able to save it. Uh, It just sounds ridiculous. How did this happen, Frankie? Yeah, well, Margaret did a great job as always. I love to shout out Margaret at Boise Dev um, for really going in depth on this story. Um, Yeah, it's it's fascinating to see this company that's based in California already sounds not great, right? (laughs) Uh, That's a villainous story that Idahoans love to glom onto, right? Love to hear it, yeah. Uh, So this venture capital firm from California, their name is DiNapoli Capital Partners. So they have, yeah, wanted to convert this assisted living facility into multifamily apartments. Now, to be fair, uh, hey, the bench needs multifamily apartments. We need housing everywhere. We need housing of all stock all across the valley. Uh, we're in a housing crisis. But it is interesting to see a place where it, it is housing people. It's housing right. vulnerable yeah. people yeah. and folks who need a lot of care and would be replaced by this multifamily housing apartment building that they would get kicked out. So it happened slowly. It happened in different phases. So this Monday meeting that happened earlier this week with planning and zoning was the second time the company came to planning and zoning. And they were admonished uh, big time in this meeting, Mm -hmm. especially by uh, Commissioner Meredith Stead, who had some very harsh words for how they've handled the communication with residents about this um, and their plans to convert this assisted living center into an apartment building. So that's where things stand right now. However, there is a chance that it could be appealed. I think it would have to be appealed by the city council at this stage. And kudos to planning and zoning, right? Again, here we are, uh, folks who volunteer for these seats. But to listen to these occupants and to slap their wrist. And by the way, it's not the first time they've slapped their wrist. It turns out, what, last December, they didn't properly communicate to the residents. Uh, So this is pretty awful. And I think that these developers have lost the media game as well. I think that, uh, I think this is a a really good story, an easy story to tell, and an easy story for people to say, oh my gosh, that's me, that's my dad, that's my granddad. Yeah, so I know about this because I have somebody uh, who I love who's in their 90s and lives there and they moved in in the fall and the family was not told at the time hey, by the way, this might not be housing that this person can have soon. We're planning on turning this into apartments. So um, I can say from firsthand experience that I know that communication was not given to at least this resident when they recently moved in and the company knew full well that they were planning to make this change. Um, So that's been really frustrating for people who live there and their families and you know, moving people who are uh, elderly and have, you know, different needs, that's hard. And it's really tough. And I thought it was interesting in the meeting how the company exec who spoke characterized it. Did you catch that, Emma? Oh, my gosh. So condescending. And <laughs> he was just like, people want to move. They they want to move for they have boyfriends oh. places right. <laughs> and like the food is better. They're actually very excited to move. And then they interview the people and they're like, I'm so worried about losing my pet. I can't find a place that, yeah. find, that takes Medicaid. I use all my savings to move in here. It's such a mess. It is such a mess. And not everybody has the family support to help them move. Yeah. So that's a real challenge as well. I should say so. Yeah, plan Planning and zoning majorly slapped their wrist at the company and said, 
okay, we're going to let you do this, but we're not going to make it easy. You're going to have to have a plan for these folks. And so it's going to be, um, basically, they're going to have to um, require, they're requiring that Arbor Village and the company behind it give tenants a year to relocate to new housing. So have a full year to find new housing. And then they have to provide some financial assistance so that they can move and then agree to pay the difference between whatever the residents find. Um, so if their rent's higher somewhere else, that they have to pay the difference for three years. But even still, it seems to be a winning uh, capitalist endeavor for this yeah. company yeah. to do that. <laughs> even with all those conditions, they're, they want to have this uh, multifamily housing uh, built instead of this uh, the Arbor Village. But one thing they could do, unfortunately, if you play this out, they could also price these tenants out. They could jack up, just say, delay their plans, but jack up their monthly cost. And by attrition, they could empty that place out. And that mm -hmm. is where there are very few laws. Yeah. And we're seeing that happen all over town, too. So right. uh, <laughs> they very well might do that. Well, uh, let's talk. Let's talk something exciting, something fun. Let's talk trains. Uh, are we excited? <laughs> Amtrak says they maybe are bringing back service to I'm Southern excited. Idaho, linking yeah, it to totally. Salt Lake. George, <laughs> I know this is your bag. I know you've been keeping a super close eye on this story. I have. And I, before moving to Idaho, even though when I moved here, Amtrak was still here. So I used to take Amtrak here too. But I have taken trains most of my life. And it, let's face it, folks, in many corners of the world, Trains are an everyday experience. They're not just a vacation experience. So yes, there has been an effort ever since Amtrak rolled out of town a few decades ago, there has been an effort to get them back here. But how do you do that? You obviously have to convince the federal government that it makes sense, and you have to convince Amtrak it makes sense. And by the way, Amtrak is uh, has been hemorrhaging money for, for quite some time. But here is a new program called, called Corridor ID. It's really smart. What it does is it requires at least two cities to come to Amtrak. So in other words, from here to there, right? And they're both, pardon the pun, on board. And so it's <laughs> Boise to Salt Lake City. And Mayor McLean, to her credit, over a year ago, she cornered the CEO of Amtrak and said, what do we need to do? We've heard of this corridor ID. Will you take us seriously? And she instantly got on the horn with the mayor of Salt Lake City, who said, yeah, let's do this. So right now, it's a bit of heavy lifting, but we have entered a stage where the public gets to weigh in. And I think this will be interesting. And what the city is looking for is it's not one of those surveys uh, where they, you know, multiple choice. It's anecdotal. Share your story. Would you like to? Have you? Uh, how do you envision this? Who might you visit? How often might you visit? Totally anecdotal. Not only here in Boise, but in Salt Lake City. And I want to make sure I get this um, an email. It's movement for everyone. All one word. Movement for, and you have to spell out for, F-O-R, everyone at cityofboise.org. Just send an email. Yeah, I'm on board, etc. So, or, or no, I don't, I don't like this idea. Um, so what are the dates? An application has to come from a joint application for Boise and, and Salt Lake to Amtrak by the end of March. Later this year, we, as in collectively the two cities, will know uh, if we are candidates for this, at which time Amtrak would give a half million dollars to put together a formal plan, and that's where we get together and actually put pencil to paper on ridership, cost, what would it take? Boise to Salt Lake City makes sense. And because once you have put your toe in the water, of course we would want to connect to Portland, right? And then of course you you know, then you go to Vegas. I'm gonna take my journalist hat off. I love trains. I love the idea of breathing and sitting down and opening up my laptop or not opening up anything and just looking out the window. There mm -hmm. is a physical element to it uh, where the world kind of washes away. Um, I think trains are great. And by the way, this has got to be the link of shoring up our rail between Canyon County and Boise, right? Treasure Valley Rail Link, and then having a circulator at the depot to bring people up to the airport and down to 
Midtown Boise. Come on, this is a solution. George, I love when you get on your train uh, soapbox because I want to jump right up there with you. Yeah, I same, love this yeah. so much. What do we think, Frankie? Are we the only people? Is this uh, like, do other people want this, do you think? Oh, gosh. I mean, I guess we'll find out once we hear what the response is to, uh, yeah, the city asking for stories and uh, what people think and if they would do this. Uh, you know what? I found a story that I did uh, actually back when I was a colleague of, of George's at Boise State Public Radio many years Years ago, and I spoke with a millennial at the time who was really interested in finding out why don't we have trains. But uh, at the time, one of the things that was brought up was um, the infrastructure repairs that would need to happen. Um, that's significant because it's been out of service for many decades now, or for many years. So um, that's that's something to consider. Um, we do have, you know, there's some federal support for this, too. Uh, uh, Senator Mike Crapo has long been an advocate of this idea. Um, but of course, it's 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 the cities right now that are leading this conversation. And the guy in the White House is Amtrak Joe. Oh, God. Right. <laughs> right. Amtrak Joe. Exactly. Exactly. It's funny, too, because I feel like, yeah, there's the romantic, romantic idea of getting on a train. But uh, I'm sure, George, you've had oh. on less romantic experiences on the train. I have myself. But you know what? My Amtrak story of going from Minneapolis to Whitefish, Montana, and getting stuck in the middle of North Dakota in sub <laughs> sub-zero weather oh my God. Uh, yeah. is one of my favorite stories to tell. So even <laughs> though it was a harrowing venture uh, many years ago when I was in college, I still love to tell it. And I think that train service in general, especially when it's reliable, um, can really help bring communities together. And of course, can go a long way, um, hopefully, to getting people, you know, to choose alternative forms of, of transportation. Especially when the weather is dicey, right? And, yes. and, you, and yeah. you need to get to Portland, you, you know, and who wants to go over yeah. the blues? Uh, and, and or you need to get to Salt Lake City. So there's certainly the need. And by the way, once you do get to Salt Lake City, then that opens up the entire Amtrak network. It's not as if this is just, you know, a point A and B. Um, but yeah, I think there's the practical side of it. Um, and I don't think many people here in the Treasure Valley remember the train. So I don't think it's as if they they're missing it. Uh, so right. it is a sell. You do have to sell this. Yeah. And, you know, this isn't the first time we've heard that they're thinking about bringing train service back to Boise. Right. So, right. George, how likely is it to happen? I don't want to get my hopes too high here. I think it's a huge difference that you have a partner and that you have a partner as significant as Salt Lake City. And by the way, Salt Lake City, if you have ever visited, they have a great light rail system yes, that they, they put in place yep. for the Olympics. So... You know that that they're they're really savvy about this. I think it's good to have a partner because it's always best to have a few of us as opposed to just one of us. You know, just doing a monologue. Well, George, you are unfortunately driving. There's no train up there, <laughs> but you're true. headed. <laughs> you're headed up to Sun Valley this weekend for a super fun event that you're running about movies. Mm, yeah, it's movie night in Sun Valley with. George Prentice. <laughs> that's the actual that's, title that's, of that's it. That's great. <laughs> I, yeah, it's just like, oh my gosh. And when I tried to paint the word picture to my colleagues and the folks at uh, the Sun Valley Film Festival, they say, now what is this? It's like, are you showing a movie? <laughs> no. Uh, it's like, what, so what are you doing? Um, it, we're going to celebrate movies. We're going to show clips. We're going to have games. We're going to have live performance. And by the way, it has all come together. And when I reach out to movie studios saying, hey, can you send us some swag? They say, what? is this and and once i explain <laughs> to them they say oh yeah what how much do you need and where can we send it so it's lots of fun uh yes we even have some live musical performance music from the movies uh some special guests um and uh uh, and then some clips and some of the interviews we're going to put up on the big screen at the Argeros of some of the people that I've talked to at uh, film festivals, et cetera, and a lot of the movies that are up for Oscars in just a few weeks. This sounds so much fun, but are there actually like, because it's on Sunday night, if people are listening to this, can they head up if they just say, oh, I, I need to get in the car and get, go see George and catch him? Totally. And make, you know, make it a day trip too. It's so cool. So it's 530 Sunday at the Argeros. As a matter of fact, the Argeros is the place to go to to get tickets, but get them now. Uh, yes, uh, there are some available, but this is unlike anything else. This is, if you love movies, this is the party that you wish you had been invited to, but didn't know existed. 
Well, it sounds amazing. And I might actually just go because that sounds <laughs> like a get out of town up to Sun Valley just to go watch you talk about movies. Sounds like absolute heaven. So we're going to have some games. Okay. So I'm going to put you guys on the spot here. All right. Uh, so here's a quote, a famous quote from a well-known movie, a classic movie. Okay. I'll tell you this. It's black and white. It was made in the 60s. Okay. And here's the quote. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. Okay. Which is a great oh. line. <laughs> made in the 60s. Gentlemen, um, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. Dr. Strange? It's exactly right. Oh, yes, Emma. Yes. Peter oh, Sellers nice. in Dr. Strange Love. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Oh, I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, another quote. I think you should get this one. Black and black and white made in the 60s. Okay. A boy's best friend is his mother. Okay. A boy's best friend is hmm. his mother. I don't think this is right, but the apartment? No. Think of oh, okay. mother. No, think no. of boy. Think of shivers. Think of mother. Shivers. It, oh, whoa. um, um, psycho? Yes. <gasps> yes. Good job, yes. Emma. <laughs> I only guessed the apartment because I just watched that. Uh, which is my ago. all time <laughs> favorite movie, by the way. <laughs> oh, mine too. Uh, oh, my, my gosh. All time favorite movie. Okay, 1981, the Oscar ceremony was postponed in less than 24 hours' notice. What happened in 1981 where the Motion Picture Academy says, we can't do this. We cannot go on the air tonight. 1981. 1981. Um, let's see. Is it a news item? Yes. That something happened. Something, something happened something around the happened world. Something happened in 1981 where the Motion Picture Academy said, we can't go on the air tonight. We we need to see what's going to happen here. Um, let's see. It was too early for it. Wasn't the Challenger? Nope. Yeah, um, it wasn't Challenger. Nope. Let's see. What would it have been in probably in March? Oh my gosh! It was my first birthday party. <laughs> yeah, it was and you, it was Emma. A it was big deal. Your it was birthday, crazy. and they all postponed <laughs> the Oscars. So let's walk through this. 1981. Who was in the White Reagan. House? Reagan. Okay. What? Oh, the assassination. Yeah, attempt. the attempted assassination <gasps> ah, attempt. Because. President Reagan had taped the introduction to the Oscars. Oh, wow. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and as of airtime, they didn't know what his condition was going to be. So the next morning, or the next day, they went ahead because obviously the president was fine. Johnny Carson, the host, came out and made some hilarious, but just, I mean, he he danced that fine line, right, of appropriate versus inappropriate. And, uh, and he, so he started, like, really ripping into Ronald Reagan movies. And, of course, it was just, oh, my God, I really needed to laugh. So Oh, wow. Okay, here is, here is my toughest trivia question, I think, of all time. Here we go. What classic novel, a classic novel, was turned into one of the highest-rated series in TV history, a musical, and an Oscar-winning film Starring Harrison Ford. Starring Harrison so, Ford. So, what novel was adapted into a TV series, one of the highest rated series of all time, by the way, back in the 60s. It was also adapted into a musical, a stage musical, and it was adapted into a serious drama. I'm going to go with Star Wars. <laughs> no. As a, like Star Wars the musical? I, I missed that one. And I missed the TV yes. series. So think of the novel. Think of the no So the source material is a classic novel. Classic novel. This one's going to really throw you. And Harrison Ford was in the series, you're saying? No, he no, was no. in this movie. So this novel, the serious story, was turned into, was adapted into a contemporary story, into a TV series, mm -hmm. right? And then years later, they said, oh, wow, I think this could be a musical. They turn into one of the most popular musicals of all time. What in the world is this? And then someone said, oh, what? It's like, oh, I think we should take this story and turn it into like a real serious drama, thriller, chase movie starring Harrison. Blade Th Runner? <laughs> okay, so, so, so here it is, guys. Here it is. Les Miserables was oh turned into The Fugitive. It was a TV show. Oh. The TV show. I mean, it's the man on the run. It, it, and, the, and they said, no, it's Les Mis Rob. Of course it was turned into Les Mis, Les Mis the Musical and The Fugitive mm -hmm. starring Harrison mm -hmm. Ford. It's all Les Mis Rob. It's this, oh, wow. it's oh this wrongly accused man on the run. Yes. Isn't that a great, uh, anyway. I so. love that. That's a good one. Yeah. That's really tough, George. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think yeah. anyone will get that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
I get points for Star Wars, though. I think <laughs> Star Wars, the TV series, or the musical sounds like a great idea. There's a whole section of Chewbacca singing. It's really moving. It's very beautiful. <laughs> You'll love it. <laughs> That's all for today here on CityCast Boise. The show is produced by Frankie Barnhill and Evelyn Avitia. Blake Hunter writes our Hey Boise newsletter, and I'm Emma Arnold. Our music is by Up Is The Down Is The. If you enjoyed our show today, leave us a review. It helps other people find us. We're taking President's Day off, but we'll be back Tuesday with more local stories. See you around, Boise. 